Let us pray. Dear Father, as we come to worship You today, Lord, may we just be filled with the presence of Your love, Lord. What an amazing love that is that God would die for sinners. And not just any sinners, but for, for us. To, to sacrifice Himself willingly on the cross. So Lord, may we come to You expectant to hear from Your Word today, to be encouraged and challenged to grow in our faith. And may all that we do today worship You and bring glory to You. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So if you'd like to turn uh, to your Bibles, we'll be in uh, 1 Timothy 4, 6-11. through 11. So if you want to turn there. Um, but while you're doing that, kind of give a recap a little bit about what's been going on. As we talked in the beginning, this letter is, is written from one man to another man. Uh, from a mentor to a student, uh, in, in many ways from a father to a son, even though they're not biologically related. If you go back to the beginning of this, in, in chapter 1, verses uh, 1 and 2, Paul writes this. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. See, as we looked at this, Paul and Timothy have, have been in ministry together for over thir- 15 years Timothy is probably in his 30s. Uh, He probably started his first journey with Paul when he was a teenager. They've been working together, and as we talked beginning, they they walked miles, hundreds and hundreds of miles together. They would have spent many nights together around campfires or or in a room. Paul would be constantly teaching him and encouraging him as he grows into a man. They would have gone through storms together. They would have fled places together. Uh, And they would have built churches together. So this is a a very tight connection. And so we see Paul's care for Timothy as Timothy is is leading this church. His care is revealed for him in taking the time to write this letter and this letter of encouragement. It is meant to be a motivation for him, an exhortation to face the trials and the hardships that are existing in this church in Ephesus. One of the very first topics in the letter is false teachers. He urges him to remain in Ephesus and charge these false teachers to teach the truth. In 1 Timothy 1.5, it says, Now the goal of our instruction is love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. So as he goes in to teach and to correct these false teachers, they have a common goal. He says it's our goal of instruction, love that comes from a pure heart, good conscience, and a sincere faith. He encourages Timothy not just to just to be there, but to fight the battle for the gospel, to fight this battle for the truth. That he is to deal with these false teachers and, and continue in according with his calling. In chapter 1, 18 and 19, it says, Timothy, my son, I am giving you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies previously made about you, so that by recalling them you may fight the good fight having faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and have shipwrecked their faith. As we continued in the letter, we saw that Paul points out the fruit of these false teachers by pointing out the ungodly conduct that was happening in the church. And then a couple weeks ago, we saw that he turned to the qualifications of the leaders that were in the church, those that had put themselves in position either by their own desire or by a lack of vetting or whatever, but there are teachers and leaders in the church that shouldn't be there. And so he tells them what the leaders should be like. And then he comes and he starts talking about the conduct of the church in 3, 14 through 15. Paul tells him again, I write these things to you, hoping to come to you soon. But if I should be delayed, I have written so that you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of truth. There's behaviors that are not appropriate in the church. And Paul is, is telling Timothy that he must address them. And last week we looked at, he gets to the point of where the source of the false teaching comes from. So it's clear to Timothy and what it says uh, in 4, 1 through 2, it says, 
Now the Spirit explicitly says in later times that some will depart from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons through the hypocrisy of liars whose consciences are seared. As we looked at that last week, we see that, that the false teachings, the lies that were filled in the church were coming through people, through lies that come from the enemy. And he is charged to take care of this. And Paul takes a turn here in this next set of scriptures, and he turns from speaking about the church, what the church is going on, who the leaders in the church to be. And he starts to speak in this section directly to Timothy, directly to his son in the faith, directly to his mentor, his friend, his companion. And so he goes there, and from front to the end of this letter, he will speak about false teaching. And Timothy, for him, this is probably not, I can almost guarantee this is not the first time, and I can pretty much guarantee this is not the first time that Timothy has heard about this warning of false teachers. We know that earlier, years earlier, Paul gathered all of the elders of the church in Acts 20, 28, 30. And he tells them this, before anything has ever happened, he tells the leaders in the church in Ephesus, be on guard for yourselves, and for all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Men will rise up, even from your own number, and distort the truth to lure the disciples into following them. And this is where Timothy finds himself today. He finds himself leading a church. But Paul wasn't there at the moment. He's not there to step in in his apostolic authority, in his boldness, in his teaching to put things right. He finds himself in the charge of Paul, basically a 30-year-old pastor in a church, and he's finding that leading people is hard. That as he looks at it, what he thought in his mind or what was going on, it's not going there. He looks out and it's not what he wants it to be. We don't know what's going on in Timothy, but maybe there's some discouragement. If you, you can kind of read in the first one where he urges him to stay, that there may be a desire of Timothy to leave. Maybe Timothy is having a hard time putting the teachings of Paul into action in the church. And so Paul must know that Timothy needs some, some personal guidance so here he turns to Timothy personally and he starts to direct and help him to fight this fight that he's called him to do. To fight this fight against the false teachers and against the conduct that was coming out of that. So our scriptures today are 1 Timothy 4, 6-11 through and we'll look at the first half of, of this part to Timothy. It says, If you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, nourished by the words of the faith and the good teaching that you have followed, but have nothing to do with pointless and silly myths. Rather, train yourself in godliness, for the training of the body has limited benefit, but godliness is beneficial in every way, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. This saying is trustworthy and deserves full acceptance. For this reason, we labor and strive because we have put our hope in the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe, command, and teach these things. So Paul starts, he says, after everything I've told you, after all the stuff that I've given you already, he says, if you point out these things, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. Isn't this what all Christians desire to be? Don't we want to be a good servant? A good servant to Jesus? This really becomes the main point of this passage as he encourages Timothy to be this good servant. As we look here, the word used for servant is diakonos, the same word that we have for deacon. But he's not telling him to be a deacon here, but to be a servant or a minister but a minister to who? To Christ, a servant of Christ. And it doesn't mean to be a slave. This is not sitting there waiting for instruction and just obeying blindly command after command. 
What Paul is painting a picture of is he's painting the picture of a person who is useful, who is, who is useful for good service, a servant. When you think about it, why do we call it customer service when you call the hotline? Or why do we call it the service industry or a service call, right? You call a plumber for a service call. We're not calling the company demanding for them to be obedient to us, though how many of us wish that's the way it worked, that if you just called the service call, that, that, but that's really not the motive there. What we are calling for is we calling them and asking them to be useful to us, to serve us, to help us with the problem that we have. When we go out to a restaurant and we are served, we are asking them to be useful to us, to help us with our evening, or when we call customer service we're asking them to help us with our problem how many of you found that when you call many times they're not useful to you they're not a service you find it a waste of time so what the idea here is is paul is is calling timothy to be a good useful servant and he tells him to be useful he says you will be useful to jesus if you point these things out to the brothers and sisters to the brethren, to the church. He is telling them to focus on the believers here, to point out the false teachings, to point out the false truths, to point out those things that are happening in the church, and to talk about the conduct and correct the conduct that is coming from the false teachings. It's interesting that as he puts this word out there to instruct Timothy to point out these things, it's different than what Paul does typically. See, as we read Scripture, we find Paul in his authority. He commands a lot of things. He uses very strong words to get the attention of people. But here he uses a word to point out. It means to gently lay down or to put something before someone's mind. To remind them. It's, it's more of a reminder or in some ways... It's a suggestion to, uh, and we'll get further into this in a little bit, but it's, there's this idea that to point these things out is not to come in and just to hammer down and say this is what it must be. He's pointing the word out over and over again to these people. It is not an instruction that comes from a demand of submission or a demand of obedience. He is told to warn, to lay down, and to remind them of the truth over and over again. It is not by the power of a man's words or the ability of his sales pitch to convince in this moment. He's not telling Timothy to make them believe. He's telling them to point them to the truth. It is to be determined and consistently putting forth the truth before the brothers and sisters in Christ. Because he's not just to be a servant or a minister to Jesus, he is to be a good servant. See, so we'll see Paul uses good, if you look in, your, in 1 Timothy, he uses good to describe many things in this letter. We see that the law is good. That he's not just to fight the fight, he's to fight the good fight. He tells him that prayer, is for, prayer for all is good and pleases God. He tells them that elders seek or overseers seek a good work. They must have a good reputation among outsiders. Deacon service will require good standing. And everything created by God is good. Paul is using this word good to point out the things that are what? Not good and the things that are good. He is establishing each one of these things to be aligned with God or is from God. And here he says to be a good servant. To be a godly servant is a good servant. And he must not refrain from dealing with the false teachers. Back to verse 6. If you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, nourished by the words of faith and the good teaching that you have followed. i got to imagine that as Timothy sits here, looking at this daunting task of going out and telling people they're wrong, right? Because that's, I mean, some people really like to tell other people they're wrong. Um, 
but some people don't. And obviously, if Timothy is in this position, he's probably hesitant about doing this. Otherwise, we wouldn't have so much encouragement from Paul in doing this. But how is Timothy to do this? What is, what is the power? What is the, the thing that's going to get Timothy to, to do this well? And he says he is to be constantly nourished while he's doing this. See, that word nourished means to be trained or to nourish in something, to be built up, to be grown in something. To go out and actually fight against the false teaching, he is going to need to be strengthened. He is going to need to be built up. He is going to need to be trained. And it comes from a specific source. He is to be trained and strengthened by the words of the faith and the good teaching that he has already been following. If you look at that word for followed, it means to follow very carefully. So Paul, as he looks at Timothy, says, Paul tells Timothy, he says, you know the words of faith. I know what you've been taught. You have been following them carefully your whole life. Be encouraged by them. Be strengthened by them. Follow them. Like I said, Paul knows what Timothy knows. He knew what he had been taught. Paul had affirmed that all that Lois and Eunice, his mother and grandmother, had taught Timothy. And then he personally taught Timothy for years in the process of growing this young man into the person he is this day. But to be a good servant, he must rely on the true teaching that he already knows. He's telling him to be encouraged by the word that has already been planted in his heart. To let the Scriptures, to let the truths continue to develop in the growing and maturity of him as a leader in the church. See, sound teaching and sound doctrine is grounded and rooted in the good interpretation of God's Word. So what he finds himself in is he finds himself battling against all of these ideas that are not grounded in God's Word. And so Paul tells them, you know God's Word. You followed it. So live it out. And he tells them, in contrast, in verse 7, he says, but have nothing to do with pointless and silly myths. Rather, train yourself in godliness. Stay close to the truth, but have nothing to do with. He basically says, avoid these false teachings. He tells him to train and discipline himself in godliness. He is to spend his time focused on that portion of it. To focus on being devoted to training and growing in godliness. Paul tells Timothy that that is what's most important. He is to train himself to be pleasing to God. To be a good servant means to be a training servant, a growing servant, a maturing servant. A servant that spends his time fixing his mind on Jesus and pointing others to do the same. Ephesians 4.14 When we don't do this, this is what happens. Or this is when we grow. He says, 4.14, Then we will no longer be little children, tossed by the waves and blown around every wind of teaching by human cunning with cleverness in the techniques of deceit. For any Christian, and specifically Timothy in this case, to not be tossed around by all of the different cunning and clever ideas that are out there, Timothy must be strengthened and nourished by the words of God. He must hold fast to them. He describes these false teachings as profane, as common. Your Bible may say pointless or may say irreverent or may say worthless. He is telling them that they are to be avoided because they have no value. They are devoid of anything worth fighting for. For. Have you ever found yourself in, a, in an argument with someone who is, is all arguing based on a false 
set of truth. If someone believes something is false, how do you convince them otherwise? They need to know the truth. They need to have something put in front of them. He says, focus on the truth. Present the truth. Be growing in the truth. He says, those, avoid those false teachings. Those silly myths. Some of your Bibles may say old womanly tales or old womanly myths. It's the same idea that we get the idiom old wives' tales from. They were describing the superstitions and the stories that that may be told to children for correction or for fear of something, right? Have you ever told your child a a big scary story so they don't go do something, right? Is it true? No, it's it's a tale that we tell our kids. We may call them fables now. But he's communicating to Timothy that these false teachings are both worthless and they're just made up ideas. So don't spend your time digging into them. Continue to put the truth in front of them as the only light that would shine on the false ideas that they have. And he is told to train and to discipline himself in godliness. And he gives this contrast between physical training and in training in godliness. In verse 8, he continues, For the training of the body has limited benefit, but godliness is beneficial in every way, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. This saying is trustworthy and deserves full acceptance. See, the word that's here for training, it's... Gymnasia. So where we get the word gymnastics or gymnasium. See, in this time period, there was a lot of emphasis on physical training. Youth would spend many times in their teens training. There were challenges and battles and the Olympics and all sorts of different ways in this society that would emphasize the physique and the physical strength of people. Basically, every Greek city would contain a gymnasium for sports or activities of physical prowess and physical challenges. And they would physically and they would focus on the physical side of training. But Paul says that physical training has a limited benefit. It has its limitations. Colossians 2:23. Although these things have a reputation for wisdom, Although these have a reputation for wisdom by promoting self-made religion, false humility, and severe treatment of the body, they are not of any value in curbing self-indulgence. There were many in this time period that that felt that if you just trained your body, that that was good enough, that that was where holiness or righteousness or godliness came from. But training your body, Paul says, has limitations. See, people can, can discipline themselves to train and conform their behavior to a standard. We're really good at faking it many times. We can put on a show. We can look moral. And many people do. They look the part. They may look moral or correct, but deep down in their own hearts, they're still motivated by their own self-indulgence, by their own wants and desires, by their own selfish desires, their pride or their greed or other sinful motivations. There are many that will put themselves into churches or put themselves into the Christian community for their own benefit. Training their behavior, training their words, training their actions to conform to what the standard says. But Paul says it's deeper than that. See, the goal of Christian training and discipline is not conformance to behavior. It is to train to grow in godliness, to have our hearts changed, to be renewed and to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We're to grow in godliness or piety, to grow in the beliefs and the ways of God. See, in the end, growing in godliness will change behavior anyways, right? 
So we can either conform or grow in godliness, which changes our behavior as well. But the, if the only reason we train is for the physical, if the only reason we train is for conformance, in the end, eventually, the sinful nature will reveal itself. And the heart of men will come out and we will see what's true there. And Paul doesn't say that physical training has no value. He says it's limited. But he says that growing and training in godliness is beneficial in every way. If you turn to 1 Corinthians 9, 24-27, it says, Don't you know that the runners in a stadium all race? But only one receives the prize. Run in such a way to win the prize. Now everyone who competes exercises self-control in everything. They do it to receive a perishable crown, but we an imperishable crown. So I do not run like one who runs aimlessly or boxes like one beating the air. Instead, I discipline my body and bring it under strict control so that after preaching others, I myself will not be disqualified. So Paul is talking about there is an aspect of physical discipline that we must have as believers and that Timothy must have as well. But it is for the purpose of godliness. It is coming from the goal of growing spiritually. So even though training in godliness has an aspect or an element of physical training, Paul calls Timothy to have training that is contrary to what we read in Corinthians. It cannot be aimless. It must be specific. It must have a goal. It must grow in godliness. And he is to train in this because, as he says, it is beneficial in every way as it holds promise for this life and the next. How many here wish, wish, that they could put everything they had, they could turn in anything and just have or be in the physical shape that they were in years ago. Someone's hand went up, most of us at some point in time. How many of us know that there was a time in our lives where we were stronger or faster or more agile and we wish we had those moments back, right? But even the person who trains their body every single day with the most precise precision in life, what can't they outrun? Time. No matter how much we try, no matter how much physical training we do, eventually time will catch up, our bodies will eventually get worn down, and we will not be able to withstand the toll of time. But Paul says, but godliness is beneficial both in this life and in the life to come. Whatever is grown in godliness here will go with us into the next life. It can be so easy to be hyper-focused on this life. How many of us find ourselves all day long thinking about this life? What do I got to do today? What do I got to eat today? What am I going to do tomorrow? What am I going to bill? What bill am I going to pay? We, we get so focused on either building wealth or building our strength, building reputation, building even maybe a church, building memories, experiences, building our homes, building our relationships. Are any of those bad? No. But when we look at it, even though these are blessings from God that we experience on earth, how many of you have figured out how to take your wealth with you to heaven? No one, right? Our kids are hoping we leave it to them. Everything we build in this world will stay here. Our strength can be removed in an instance. A simple car accident or a diagnosis of cancer or even slowly old age, our health, our physical being can be removed. I think Timothy is bombarded with these false teachings and this challenge to go out there and to fight the fight. And Paul is telling him to focus on the Lord. Focus on the promise. Grow in godliness. Godliness. 
The promise that God abides in all believers. That He dwells in Him. That He dwells in us. That Christ intercedes for them. That He saves them. That God draws near to those that draw near to Him. That Christ hears their prayers. And as we sang this morning, is abundant in love and loves His children. But even though we're to focus on all of those things, Timothy is told, and we are as well, that we are left on earth for a purpose, for a work, to do things, to grow in godliness, to serve Christ as a good servant. And as we do that, the things that are built are things that have benefit in this life and in the benefit in the life to come. And so when we enter that promised hope of eternal life with the Savior God in heaven, when we have full peace and full hope in the love of God, we will see what we have grown in godliness and what that benefit is. And he says, for this reason, in verse 10, for this reason we labor and strive because we have put our hope in the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. He says, for this reason, we labor and strive. He tells Timothy, don't forget why we do this. Why we toil, he says. The word toil means to work until weariness and fatigue set in. To work to exhaustion. He says, Timothy, my son, this is why we toil. This is why we work to exhaustion. This is why we're worn out and we're weary. This is a hard work. It's not an easy life. I mean, I... I start to read this verse and as I thought about it, my mind kind of went back a little bit to, to the past generations. And I don't think we have to go back very far. But generations in, of our country where it wasn't very long ago that people got up before the sun came up and they worked for hours. And when the sun came up, they worked all day. And when the sun went down, they worked a little bit more. They toiled. They worked. They had a work ethic that expended all energy each day on the tasks that were set before them. We look back at, if you start reading about the Reformers or the Puritans or or different stages in church history, it's amazing to look back at the commitment they had to the toil and the labor of leading. It almost seems craziest today when they would preach multiple times on Sunday different messages to the same people. That seems outrageous. Spurgeon at times preached ten times a week. He said, I'm going to burn myself, tell, burn myself out teaching people about God. And, that was, and they had this desire to toil because the reason was that important. They would preach different times throughout the week. And the interesting thing is they would preach three times on Sunday and guess what was not there? Everything else. There were no announcements. There was no music. There was just preaching the Word hours each day so people could be nourished and grown by the words of God. I'm not saying we're going to take out our music or anything like that, but what I'm saying is like if you look back at the times, what we look today, we look at missionaries. How many of you have favorite missionaries that you've read about and you think about and you're just amazed by what they sacrificed, the toil, the amount of work they went through to reach a person or to do the service of God in a foreign land as they lived out the Great Commission? Or even in our own country, As I've talked around and and even in the American church, you only have to go back 30 or 40 years and it's much different. Who here remembers going to church twice on Sundays as a kid? 
and heard different messages? Or how about a midweek prayer service on top of that? Or maybe even a visitation on another day? Or what about training union? Where you showed up for an hour every week just to learn how to be a Christian. That was like 30 years ago, training union. I've been trying to find documents on that because today, I don't think there are very many that are like, if you have an hour to teach me how to be a better Christian, how to serve God better, I'll sign up for that. I don't know if you can be definitively stated, but I would think that today in our history, where we're at today, we could probably say that in the 21st century here, we're probably experiencing one of the times where the church gathers the least and does the least amount of work for God. Do we agree with that? Do we gather as the church under the glorious cover of God to be with His people, to fellowship with one another, to encourage one another, to grow so that we aren't tossed around by every idea that comes out there? So much has changed as we look around and I keep asking people if this is true. Was it different before? And what were the benefits of that? But I think that many times we find ourselves, we do church just enough. I'm not sure what all changed. But I think one thing is the same issue that's happening in Timothy's church is that many times false teaching is allowed to enter into the church. And I'm not even saying blatant false teaching. Slight, little nuances. And it's not just the church, but it's also been more dangerously put in the pulpit. I think we can say that the Word of God has been exchanged for the charismatic ideas of men. Congregations are focused on the things of this world instead of the promise of the next. I think things have to change. And one of the things we need to do is as a church, the church is also responsible for know the Word well enough to counteract false teaching from the pulpit. We all need to be growing. As leaders of churches are not trained or vetted of the Word of God, and they're allowed to continue in leadership even when they have disqualified themselves, Many church pastors go to the church like it's a job. Nine to five. Clock in, clock out. As long as it fits my schedule, as long as it meets my needs, as long as it pays my bills, as long as it is easy and comfortable, I am good here. And I'm not saying this is every pastor because I know some that work really, really hard. But Paul tells Timothy that this work is a hard work. It's a fatiguing work. It's a toil. It will wear on you physically. It will wear on you emotionally. It will wear on you spiritually. And he tells Timothy, but we continue. Why? Because of the promise. Because of the hope. Because what we profess to be true that Christ died for us and that He is building His kingdom and He has given us a work to do. He's given Timothy a work to do. He says they will toil and strive. That word strive means to be harshly criticized or suffer reproach. 
It's actually the, where we get the word agony from. Toil and agony. It sounds like this is a fun life, right? Toil and agony. He says, Timothy, you will be accused of things. We look at like Moses when he was challenged by Miriam and Aaron or challenged by Korah about his leadership. We see throughout Scriptures continually that leaders of God's people will be challenged, falsely accused of things. We see Jesus as He walked on this earth criticized and ridiculed. I think it would be hard for us to say that Jesus had a very pleasant walk on this earth. It was hard. He was exhausted. And so we will find ourselves accused. Timothy is being told he has to go and boldly correct those that are in the church that are in error. Like I said, I don't know any of us who are super great about accepting it when people tell us we are wrong. How many of us are just like, yes, bring it on. Tell me I screwed up again, right? Like, Tell me where I think wrong. Tell me where I did wrong. Tell me where my behavior is wrong. That's hard. And that's exactly what Timothy is being told to do. It's against our nature, our sin nature, to not rebel. See, when people are confronted with the truth, many times the response is not okay. The response is blame or deflect. It's not my fault. They did it first. It's actually not my fault, it's your fault. You're the pastor. If I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do, that's your fault. Right? How many of your kids have used that line on you at some point in time in your parenting? Right? It's my fault that I'm disobeying you right now. No, no, it's your fault you're disobeying me right now. Right? But we see in our kids, you, you go and you say, why did you do that? Well, they did that first. Well, that's not what I asked. I asked, why did you do that? Well, they treated me, that's not, no, why did you do your own action? When you look at children, you see this nature pop right out. And so when the leader of the church, as Timothy goes into his church and starts to preach and teach and, and reveal the Word of God, and as it challenges hearts, one of the things that you will find or he will find, that any believer will find as they go in and share the truth with someone is that they don't always take it well. And there will be accusations and challenges and hardships. And, and even though all of that may come, he still says we must continue. He says, for this reason, we labor and strive because we have put our hope in the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Once again, Paul continually points back in his teachings, in his writings, to put your trust in the hope that we have, in the promise. And here he says that they have put our hope and trust in the living God. See, the living God was a distinction that they wrote in the Scriptures because it separated the living God from all of the other false gods. The other idols. I watched a debate this week between an atheist and a talk show host about belief. Why one was why one believed one and the other one. And the atheist basically said, Well, there are about three thousand gods, little g gods in the world. He says, I don't believe in any of them, and you believe in one. So we're really all not that much different, right? No. You can't be any more different because there's only one living God. There's one and then there's all the rest. And you either believe in the one or you don't. The other 299, they aren't even in the picture. You either believe in one or none. Because there is only one God that created everything. There's only one God that saves. There's only one God who lives. John 3, 16 through 18. For God so loved the world in this way. He gave His one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Anyone who believes in Him is not condemned. 
But anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. Over and over again, one and only, one God, one Lord, one Savior, one way, one hope, one truth. See, Paul and Timothy says, For we have put our hope and trust in the only living God. It's what motivates them. It's what keeps them going. It's why they continue to toil and strive and to put up with all of the, the inconveniences and the hardships of the ministry. And he says they put their hope and trust in the only living God who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Now as we look at that, this doesn't mean that God saves every person from the wrath of God. For if that were true, if that was what Paul was stating, then we would have to throw out Jesus' own words in Matthew in the parable of the sheep and goats. Matthew 25, 41. Then he will also say to those on the left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And later in the parable in verse 46, it says, And they will go into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So there is a truth that there are those that are saved eternally and those that are not saved. Those that are saved from eternal punishment into eternal life through the one and only living God. John 14, 6-7, Jesus told them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know, also know my Father. From now on, you do know him as and have seen him. So through faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is the only way to the Father God. It's the only way men are reconciled back to God. So Paul cannot be advocating for all men everywhere to be saved eternally. One clue that we must look into is the word especially. It's the same group of people, but especially for believers. It's a different degree. It doesn't separate the believer into a completely different bucket. It is a, another level of saving. See, God is the Savior of all people, but to the believer, they are saved to a higher degree. See, all men who are ever born are saved from instant punishment for their sin the day they were born. And it says God withholds that punishment for the duration of an unbeliever's life. So all men, while they live, all men and women, while they live, will experience many blessings of God, even though they are not saved spiritually. So God is a Savior. We see Him save them through war. We see them save people in many different ways. But when it comes to salvation, there is only one way. And God, and in Acts 17, 25, it says this. It says, Neither is He served by human hands as though He needed anything, since He Himself gives everyone life and breath and all things. All people are given life. In Matthew 45, 545, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven, for he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. See, there are ways that God saves all people in this world as they live physically here on life, on, on this earth. There are many blessings that are on the righteous and the unrighteous. But for the believer, God is the Savior from God himself from the due punishment that sins are incurred by all people, Romans 3, 21 through 26. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed, attested by the law and prophets. The righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, since there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented him as, a mercy, as the mercy seat by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. 
God presented him to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and justify the one who has faith in Jesus. See, God presented Jesus in his justice that those that have faith in Jesus would be justified from God and justified before God. They would be found not guilty before the judgment. And those that do not have faith will be found guilty. They will have been found guilty and earned their punishment. See, Paul has set his hope, and Timothy has set his hope on this living God through the saving work of God's Son. Jesus, the Son, on the cross, the only atoning sacrifice for all men. And as they put their trust in the work of Christ, as they put their trust in the one and only living God, this is why they toil and strive to be good and useful servants for Christ Jesus. And he finishes it with his personal encouragement and instruction with this. Command and teach these things. Now in your Bible, it may be before or after, maybe in the next section or this section, but, but as the next section goes into basically telling Timothy to be an example, I don't think he commands everyone to be an example of himself in the sense of a command. He commands them to teach these things. Before he was to gently lay these things before the brothers and sisters, and here in this verse he says to command and teach them. So he's to lay them down gently, but not remove their authority. He was to tell the truth, tell the truths of God, and not water them down. To not muddy the waters. The commands come from the Word. And he is to give them to the church, to the brothers and sisters. He is not to diminish them. He is not to take away from them. He is not to give part of them. He is to teach the word it is to be authority, authoritative. I think as much as Timothy did not want to tackle the false teachers or was even struggling to do so if he wanted to, he knew that he would face disagreement, accusation, ridicule, but Paul says, this is what I left you there to do. This is your charge, to deal with the false teachers and to grow the church, as we see in Colossians 1, 28-29. He says, we proclaim Him, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. I labor for this, striving with His strength that works powerfully in me. See, the work of a minister, the work of a servant of Christ relies on the strength of God because it's a hard work. It takes its toll, but it's a good work. The goal for all of us, personally, should be to mature, to be mature, to be presented mature. The goal of every pastor should be to labor to that end, to help the church, the brothers and sisters, grow in maturity so that they will lack nothing. So as we look at this exhortation to Timothy, and we ask ourselves, well, Paul is talking to Timothy, right? These are, this is just Paul teaching this man. Does any of this apply to us? Well, as next week, Paul will turn into and say, be an example to all of the believers. If Paul just told Timothy how to live his life, guess what example he's going to give us? His life. So yes, these are applicable to all of us today. Because the charge was to be a good servant. Isn't that something we all desire? To be useful to God? So it applies to all believers. We are all to be good servants. We all should desire that. We should all be growing in our usefulness for the Lord. And if you go back through them, we, are, we should want to serve. And many times in our groups, we will have to deal with false teaching. Laying them before the brothers, pointing it out, the truth. We are to seek and know the Word, to be trained and nourished by it, 
to be built up. We're to avoid the pointless and silly myths that exist around us. And it says we are to train. Three times in there he talks about training. Training specifically and purposefully growing in godliness. I don't know anyone who has ever communicated to me that they grew in godliness accidentally. I think the question we must ask ourselves is what's, what is our next step in training? When we look at we are growing godliness for this life and the next, if we want a new job or want to win, if you look at like the idea of an athlete, if an athlete wants to win the Olympic medal, what do they do? They train. They look four years out and they say, what do I need to do? What's my goal to win that medal? They study. They figure it out. And then they go backwards a year and go, okay, what's my, what's my goal yearly? I have four years. Where do I want to be each year? Then you go monthly. Where do I want to go each week or each month and each week? And you get to a point that you're down to the point that what does an athlete do? They go out today, wake up in the morning, and they say, this is what I have to do today to achieve my goal four years from now. So when we look and we train in godliness and we look at the, the goal is eternal life and our life next, what is our next step of training? We train for everything in this world. How many of you have trained to get a job promotion? How many of you went to school for 12 years as much as you hated it from K through 12? You were trained. For what? For a lot of different things. Right? How many of you have ever been an athlete? You trained. How many of you got tired of throwing the ball at the hoop or running? You trained. How many of you wanted to be a musician? You trained. What do you start with? Chords? Notes? You start at the very basics. I would say right now in the church today, the average believer doesn't have any idea of how to train. And probably has no real idea that they should be training. What do you read? What do you study? What group do you go to? What questions do you ask? Where are you weak in your knowledge? Where are your thoughts? Paul is telling Timothy, be nourished by the word of God that you've already known. So my, my question today, part of this is, sit down this week and go, what do I need to do to train in godliness? And if your answer is, I don't have a clue, then send me a text message. Give me a call. We'll find some place to start and work our way through that. See, we should be thinking about and walking and talking in the light of God and work and training for it. And many times we'll find that to be a Christian is not a cakewalk. There will be hard times and long times and fatiguing times. There are also great times in the process. But it is a good work that we are called to do. And as Paul calls Timothy to this good work, I think we're called to the good work as well. To be a good servant for Jesus, we must train. Train in righteousness. Train in the Word. Train in godliness. Some of the things that uh, I thought about today, so how do we train? Well, one, read the Word. Two, apply the Word. One thing that kind of me and my wife were talking about this week was, was how many of you have voting pamphlets on your table right now, at, on your counter how many of you are dreading opening those and, and working through them, right? But, but we were kind of talking about how our parents never really sat down with us and, and really kind of worked through what, what that looked like, how to do that. You know, so one of the things that we're going to try this year is we're going to, we're going to work with our kids for this election cycle and we're going to sit down with those pamphlets and we're going to just walk through that 
And we're going to look at what it looks like and, and the struggle it is to, to, to vet and, and to pray and to, to think about and to bring the wor- word before our election and to sit there with our kids and walk with them and go, this is, this is the challenge, this is the dilemma to, to follow the authorities but also to f- look at what these people believe in and what they stand for. So training sometimes takes just take the word and sit down in the things that we are doing, applying it to the aspects of our life. There's lots of other ways to do of, of training, but those are just some that just popped up to this week for us. Train your children how to do biblical finances. How, train them in the word. Train them in so many different ways. But the biggest thing is to, to be honest, have a plan of some type. Not for workspace stuff, but to grow in maturity and godliness. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, as we sit before your word, as we hear what you wrote through Paul to Timothy, as they were, as Paul told Timothy, to continually focus, to focus and be motivated by the hope and promises that we have in you, that we live for the next life, as we are ambassadors and citizens of heaven and ambassadors in this world, Lord. May you put on our hearts and reveal to us the things that we are building that are in this world that will go away. Make them second value to the things that are eternal, the things that will never rust or decay. Lord, help us to to keep our minds on you, to be intentional in growing personally in our lives, growing in our families and growing in our church, Lord. Lord, I pray that that you continue to, to keep the word foremost in all of the things that we do, that the word of God will continually shine a light on any false teachings that may creep up in our different conversations and in our churches or in our church, Lord. We pray for other churches as well as your as your body of believers, as your your children, as your bride, Lord. We pray that that your church, that your bride would be convicted to follow the words of Paul to Timothy to be encouraged by them, those pastors that are weary and toiling and, and worn down, Lord. Pray that your word and your Holy Spirit will remind them that the work is worth it, that their hope drives them, Lord. Lord, I pray that churches would be gravitated and addicted to your word to know it, to be devoted to it, to spend time in it, to want to know it, to want to hear from you through it, Lord. Lord, I pray that you continue to encourage us as believers to grow in our maturity, to grow in our stature, to grow in our belief, to grow to be useful servants of you, that you can use us in this world to grow your kingdom, to share your gospel, and to fight the fight that Paul is calling Timothy to fight. To pick up the armor of God and to go out and fight against the schemes of the enemy. Lord, I pray that your word will sit deep in our hearts today, that we'll be challenged and encouraged by it. Lord, you are a God of love, one that has loved us so deeply. And over and over again, we reject that. But Lord, I pray that that we would not be forgetful, that we would live in that love. Lord, we come to you today with humble and contrite hearts. Continue to speak through us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.